Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, pretty obvious first question sort of leading into this is why would I want to do this? Um, I'm not a programmer, I'm a chemical engineer, so uh, I'll give you some background here. Um, so going from wood to paper, a lot of people know paper is made out of wood, don't really know too much of it in between. So if you look at what wood looks like sort of on a really small level, it's sort of a collection of really tiny tubes, um, fibers, uh, and they're all kind of glued together. And it's disassembling all those fibers from one another and then putting them all into a sheet so they intertwine. Uh, and then you have paper. So you can see sort of, that's what newsprint looks like really close up in a cross-sectional view. So you get all these sort of hollow fibers overlapping and intermingling and you make paper. Um, it takes a lot of energy, something like 10% of VCs electricity. So uh, a lot of people put a lot of time into how, sort of asking the question, how do, we, how do we make that number go down? Um, it turns out if you compress wood chips and then soak them in some chemicals beforehand, you can reduce the amount of energy. It's pretty good, but uh, no one really knows the different temperatures of compression, how fast you're compressing, how much you're compressing, all sorts of things would presumably affect the wood chip structure and the impregnation efficiency of chemicals. Um, so the plan of attack is if we can characterize the products, we can sort of then get the response surface out of our process and optimize it somehow, um, or at least I'd better understand it. Um, what we can do is I know how to take pictures under a microscope that look like that, that give sort of a distribution of pore sizes, void spaces, holes in wood. Um, I know a little bit of programming, not an expert, but I know a little bit, and hopefully by combining the two, I can come up with kind of a, a, a way of characterizing the wood chips and through those, the process that produced them. Um, so I want to sample the pore size distribution, I do some image analysis, and then fit some models and then see what results. So uh, sample preparation is we've compressed these wood chips or just raw wood, um, take a really thin, thin slice of that, really sharp razor blade diet, put it on a, a microscope slide and then take a picture of it. And what you get out is something that looks like this. So the tree rings that you see in a piece of wood, that's just, that's a, sh that's a size thing when it cut, like the, of different fibers. So really big fibers, really small fibers, stuff that's small grew in the fall, stuff that's big grew in the summer and spring. Um, that's great, we wanna extract some pore sizes out of that. So going from that to that, came up with this algorithm. Uh, if you take off the blue layer, that turned out to be pretty important, it's getting good images, dyeing the chips first. Uh, turn that blue layer of the image, so what's solid, what's not solid, into black and white, so it's very obvious what's solid and not solid, binarize it. Uh, you can then find contours, so find holes, figure out the area of those contours, area of the holes, you got a pore size distribution. Um, so in OpenCV, that looks something like this, and this is, to me, very, very impressive. I'm a non-expert in all of this, um, and the level of, of, excuse me, level of abstraction is, is magnificent here. Um, you can split things with a single function call, you can threshold things with a single function call. That Otsu binarization is, is this massive minimization procedure all wrapped into like sort of a nice sort of convenient little function there. Uh, you can find contours, that's really straightforward, and then you can scale things uh, according to whatever length scale you want to use. Um, so that in reality looks something like going from raw image to just the blue layer in grayscale, and then binarize it, so that's that image in just black and white. And then finally, all the contours we found in yellow overlaid on a grayscale version of the original. You see it missed some stuff, it's not perfect, but um, it does a really good job over a large sample size. Uh, so finally, your histogram of pore area. So this is really good, this is, this is sort of a fingerprint of wood, this is what the structure looks like. Um, but it's, it's only a sample of tons and tons of pores, right? Fibers are, you know, tens of microns thick. You have tons of wood chips going through one of these things. Uh, you can't take enough pictures in the world to get like a good representative sample. So we did some model fitting. Um, and so, you know, going back to the tree ring thing, there's some big pores, there's some little pores. Uh, both of those sort of bigger pores, littler pores in the little and big. So we know that it's, so we uh, you can do sort of like a weighted sum of different distributions. Uh, we even know that it's like we expect it to be log normally distributed. So that's, we can specify a model type, we can sort of get our parameter set, an optimum parameter set, doing this maximization of like a, a likelihood function. Um, but that, that's, that's unpleasant, that's a lot of math. I'm a chemical engineer, I don't, I don't know anything. Um, but scikit-learn does, and it provides a lot of really good utilities. Um, so, we can specify models, we can fit models, we can then extract information out of those models, so like basically a parameter set is available. 
um, that all looks like this. Um, so scikit-learn.mixture.gmm gives this math, this fantastic mixture object. Um, basically, you just have to initialize it. You can go through a whole big maximization procedure just with a dot fit call. So that's fantastic. Uh, and then you can get information about your model. So you can then access different weights, means of those distributions, uh, even some statistical uh, model comparison stuff, that BIC at the bottom is all really readily available to you uh, through scikit-learn. And so sort of the final product, the, the thing that we want, and now that we have, is this. Uh, you can see there's a histogram of actual data and then components in there. Each one's just a Gaussian distribution. Add all those up and you get the dark red one. So now we have numbers that we can associate with a process, um, process parameters, and then using a whole bunch of different process parameters come up with a, how does the process affect the structure? Um, so a little bit of insight into what's going on into the process. Um, what I've plotted here is the overall distribution, mean, and then plus minus one standard deviation, just sort of to, to help in qualitatively interpreting these kinds of things. But what we have here is the, the, the blue distribution is of raw wood. So untouched wood, if you cut a piece out of a tree, you get something that looks like that. A lot of big ones, not so many small ones. Makes sense. Uh, when you start compressing things, uh, the red line there that corresponds to the histogram is you start, you see a reduction in the number of large pores um, without seeing a reduction in the total number of pore area, which is really important because that means that liquid uptake is determined is, sorry, is affected not only by sort of the pore sizes, but the number of pores. And if porosity is conserved, you start playing with number of pores and pore sizes, which is interesting. Basically, it big ones buckle before small ones. Um, you can also take a look at hardwood. Hardwood, the difference in terms of morphological sense is it has these really big pores. Um, same thing, but just bigger. Um, basically, they move fluid around the tree uh, in the spring, and then they don't need to all year, so it's, you can sort of afford to shut a whole piece of the tree off in the winter. Um, so you could expect to see something that's very heavily bimodal, and indeed we do, um, which, again, the blue is sort of untreated chips. That's just raw aspen. Um, but the red one is once you start compressing it, you can see a massive reduction in the number of big pores. So you, you, your targeted destruction of big structures in wood is very obvious to see. Um, so things that I've learned doing all this. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a programmer. i not all that. But it's fantastic to, to be able to use all these great tools developed by really smart people um, and get something that speaks to the physics of a problem. To me, that's really impressive. Um, image analysis, uh, if you're planning on doing anything yourself, take good pictures first. It makes all of the code, code interaction with the images a lot nicer. If you have control over that, I recommend it. Uh, documentation is important, probably not doesn't need to be said, but doc strings are blow my mind how many days they've just saved me with like trying to figure out my own work. Uh, in terms of the physics, what have we learned? Uh, wood structure is really complex. I thought it was going to be pretty obvious what would happen, but it's not. It's nonlinear responses out of everything. Um, and one sort of surprising thing is we started to change the temperature on some of these trials, and that seemed to really change the results. So that was sort of an interesting thing that we've learned out of this. Uh, I got to think my Supervisors and other group members, and Miller Western and House Sound basically stole some of their wood chips, so they're pretty cool about that. Thanks. <laughs>